good, wasn't it? Yeah. Amen. Boy, I tell you, I'm looking forward to that day, aren't you? I'm looking forward to that day. He and I have a mutual friend together, Mark Trammell. Mark Trammell's one of my sweetest friends. Mark Trammell Quartet, one of the one of the top names in gospel music, and he lives in Gadsden, Alabama, and I talk to him a lot. He and I are together a lot. We've already been together three times this month in Bible conferences and revivals, but I sure do love Mark Trammell. If you've never heard him and his quartet, you ought to get online or some way get the chance to hear them. What a wonderful Tuesday night crowd. I was telling the pastor, uh, usually in most of my revival meetings, Tuesday night is the lowest attended night. And I don't know why that's so. It must be in the Bible somewhere. I'm not sure. But anyway, you have broken the rule. We have a great crowd here tonight, and thank you for coming. And uh, I'll have you out. They said on the news tonight that the president's speech was going to be long, and so he'll still be talking when you get home tonight. And if you don't get all of it, just keep watching. They'll play it again and again and again and again and again. But anyway, I'm glad that you're here tonight. Thank you so much for coming. Well, take your Bible and turn to the Old Testament book of 2 Kings. 2 Kings chapter 13. I'll give you just a minute to run to the index to find out what page it's on. <laughs> I, I have a sermon from time to time I preach out of the book of Nahum. And when I say, take your Bibles and turn to Nahum, that takes a while. I can, I can make a quilt while people are finding the book of Nahum. Well, what are you going to do when you get to heaven and Nahum comes up to you and says, how'd you like my book? <laughs> so you ought to go home tonight and read the book of Nahum. But anyway, uh, 2 Kings chapter 13. It's good to see Brother Moose and Miss Robin back again tonight from Salem Baptist Church up in Aner. By the way, I'll be with them in November for the sixth time in revival. Boy, it's a sweet church. They remind You remind me a lot of them. Your spirit is very similar. And so when I'm there in November, I, the pastor will be kind enough to tell you when that is. Come up and see us, will you? If you can't come, send your offer, and that'll be a good thing. <laughs> Second Kings chapter 13. If you have found it, say amen. amen. I'm going to begin reading in verse 14. Second Kings 13, verse 14. Now, Elisha was fallen sick of the sickness whereof he died. And Joash, the king of Israel, came down unto him and, and wept over his face and said, Oh, my father, my father, the chariot of Israel and the horsemen thereof. Now go down to verse 20. And Elisha died and they buried him. And the bands of Moab invaded the land at the coming in of the year. And it came to pass, as they were burying a man, that, behold, they spied a band of men, and they cast the man into the sepulcher of Elisha. And when the man was let down and touched the bones of Elisha, he revived, he came back to life, and stood up on his feet. There are, there are some names in the Bible that are so associated with other names in the Bible, you get the impression they sort of came in pairs. Like uh, Ruth and Naomi. You don't think of one without thinking about the other. Paul and Timothy, James and John, Mary and Martha. And there are several like that, but of all of those names that seem to come in pairs, the top of the list would be Elijah and Elisha. You cannot think of one of those men without thinking about the other. Elijah and Elisha were the two most revered and beloved prophets of the Old Testament. There were hundreds and hundreds of Old Testament prophets. Now, some of them were false prophets, but most of them were genuine men who had been called of God to be his prophets in the days of the Old Testament. Most of them, we have no idea who they were. We don't know their name. We don't know where they preached or where they served. We know nothing about them. We know a few of the Old Testament prophets simply because 
they wrote books that are found in the Bible, like Daniel and Ezekiel and Jeremiah and Isaiah and Amos and Joel and Obadiah and Zephaniah and Zechariah. All of those were Old Testament prophets who wrote books of the Old Testament. But, but the great, great majority of the Old Testament prophets were men who really loved God, who really served God, and they died and there's not one thing known about them at all. But Elijah and Elisha were the two best known and the two most loved prophets of the Old Testament. And they were very, very different. Elijah is an unusual man. As a matter of fact, he may be the most unusual man in the Bible. He just appears out of nowhere. It's almost like he just parachuted out of the sky. We don't have any idea who his mother was or who his daddy was. He's, we're told he's Elijah the Tishbite, but what is a Tishbite? I have never in my life met a Tishbite. I mean, it sounds like something you ought to call the pest control people to come take care of. But Elijah was a Tishbite, whatever that means, and yet we see him for the very first time in the palace of King Ahab, king of Israel. Ahab was a wicked king, and he had married an even more wicked woman, a woman by the name of Jezebel. And you know, she pretty well ruined that name. I have met lots of people who carried Bible names, but I've never met any woman named Jezebel. Never in all of my life. Because that Jezebel was such a hellish woman, she ruined it for everybody else. But she was a pagan, and she brought her paganism into Israel when she married Ahab. And so all over Israel, there were these pagan altars to pagan gods. And I want to tell you, the Bible says God is a jealous God, and he, he detests, he abhors pagan idolatry. He ab abhors it. And so Ahab and Jezebel were wicked, ungodly people. Ahab was a Jew, but he was still an ungodly man. The Bible says of him that he did more evil than all those who came before him. And so God had had all he was going to take from Ahab. You can push God too far. I want to tell you, you need to know that. You can push God too far. America better learn that lesson pretty quick. And so uh, Elijah, God sent him into the palace of Ahab. The first time we see him, he's right there in the presence of the king. And he says, King, I have come to deliver a message to you from God. And God wants you to know that he's tired of you. He's tired of your wife. He's fed up with the way you're living. He's, he's fed up with what you've done to his people by leading them into paganism. And God wants you to know it's not going to rain one drop of rain in Israel. It's not going to rain anymore until I say so. And after he delivered that message, he turned and he walked out. And there was Ahab in all of his glory <laughs> with his feathers wilting now because the prophet of God had delivered that message of judgment. Well, it went for a period of over three years and there was not one single drop of rain. Exactly what Elijah had said took place. And so Elijah was just an unusual prophet. He calls down fire at Mount Carmel and burns up all of those false prophets of Jezebel's crowd. And I mean, he was an unusual man of God. And after his ministry of about 10 years came to an end, God came down and in a fiery chariot and a whirlwind, and Elijah went to heaven without even dying. I mean, he never even experienced death. When God was finished with him, he sent a chariot of fire down to get him, and up he goes. But Elisha was very different. Elisha, we know who his mother and dad were. We know where he came from. We know all about his background. Elisha had been an underling prophet alongside of Elisha. He was sort of an assistant prophet to Elisha. 
But when Elijah was caught up in that fiery chariot, Elisha was standing right there watching him go up. And he cried out and he said, Elisha, Elijah, Elijah, please send me a double portion of your spirit. And it seems as though God answered that prayer. Because Elijah's ministry only lasted 10 years. Elisha's ministry lasted 55 years years. When you read the Old Testament, there are eight miracles recorded that Elijah performed, but there are 16 miracles recorded that Elisha performed. And so God gave him a double portion of the powerful spirit of God upon his ministry. You know, I've never seen anybody caught up into heaven in a fiery chariot, have you? I would have an idea that would be something you would never, never forget. But Elisha was there and he saw that happen. He saw Elijah going up in that fiery chariot. And I have an idea there were probably times when Elisha wondered, I wonder how God is going to come get me. Do you ever fantasize about your death? Now, don't look at me spiritual. Somebody said, Brother Bob, do you ever fantasize about your death? Oh, yes. Well, Brother Bob, how would you like to die? Well, I would like to die in a vat of chocolate milkshake trying to swim my way out. But Elisha probably thought many times, well, I saw how God came and got Elijah. I wonder how God's going to come and get me. But after 55 years of faithful service, there was no chariot of fire. There was no whirlwind. The Bible says that he died as an old man from sickness. A sick old man. Now the Bible says that Joash, who was then the king of Israel, Joash came down and he wept over the face of Elisha. But now don't get too impressed by that. Because, El- because Joash was an even more ungodly king than Ahab had been. And he did what he did, not because he was broken hearted that Elisha was going to heaven. He did what he did so that he could be seen by the people. Some things never change, and politicians is one of those things that never change. It was all a show. It was all a pretense. And so there he was with those big old crocodile tears falling down into the face of Elisha. And I'm sure Elisha appreciated that. And oh, my father, oh, my father, the chariot of Israel, all that stuff. So don't get too impressed with the broken heartedness of Joash. It was all for show. Years and years ago, I was on the staff of a church in Little Rock, Arkansas. I was, I was the assistant pastor at Olivet Baptist Church in Little Rock, Arkansas. It's a wonderful church. Our pastor was Dr. Russell Clearman, an outstanding preacher. And part of my job was to go from time to time to visit our members that were in nursing homes. And I did that regularly. And one of the ladies from our church, she was about 100 years old, Her body was very, very frail, but her mind was still somewhat sharp, and I enjoyed visiting with her. It was always a delight to go and see her. She always made me laugh. She could remember things that I never even thought about, and it was just a joy to visit with her. I asked one of the nurses one day when I was leaving the nursing home, I said, I said, does this lady have any family? And she said, the nurse said, well, she has two daughters, and she has one son. I said, well, I'm sure that her daughters and her son come and visit her often because she's such a delightful person. And the nurse said, Brother Bob, her two daughters and her son have not been here 
to see her in five years. They have not walked through the door of this nursing home since she came here. They never, never come to see her. She talks about them all the time, and they've never come to see her. Well, she died. And when she died, our pastor was overseas on some kind of a mission endeavor, and so it fell my lot to do the funeral of that old lady. It was at the nurse at the funeral home. We had her service at the funeral home. And uh, so when the time for her service came, there weren't a whole lot of people there. You know, when you get to be 100, most of the people you know are already gone, so the crowd's not going to be real big. But there were a few people there, and then, then her family came in, her two daughters and her son, and they came in and sat right on the very front row. And someone started singing, someone was singing at the funeral, and, and during the singing, one of those daughters stood up and walked up to the casket in, in Arkansas. They leave the casket open throughout the entire service. Now, in Alabama, we don't do that. We shut them up. But in Arkansas, they leave the service, they leave the casket open. And so while this guy was singing, I don't remember what he was singing, but this lady got up and went up to the casket and began to say, Oh, Mama, oh, Mama, I love you, Mama. I miss you, Mama. Oh, Mama, I love you so much. Now, she hadn't been to see her mother in five years. Now, not to be outdone, that other heifer came up, and she said, oh, mama, oh, mama, mama, nobody loves you like I do. I love you. Mama, I want to go with you. And she reached in, put her arms around that corpse of her mother, and she hiked up her leg like she was going to get in the cat. Mama, I want to go with you. I want to go with you. The undertaker looked at me and said, what shall I do? I said, let her go. I guarantee you when you bring the lid down on that box, she'll come out. You don't have to worry about that. But the son, he never said a word. I think he was so humiliated and embarrassed by his sisters. But that's the way Joash was. It was all just a show to try to impress somebody else. And Elisha died. And the Bible said, and they buried him. That's what you do with dead people. You don't put them in a closet. You don't hang them on the mantelpiece. When you die, you're buried. And so they, he died and he was buried. I do not know how long he was in the grave before this next event took place. But he had been in the grave long enough for his flesh to have rotted off of his bones. Now that takes different times for different folks, depending on if they've been embalmed and if how dry their, their coffin remains. Well, they didn't have coffins in the day of Elisha. They just wrapped them in burial clothes, rags and put them in a sepulcher and rolled a stone over, and that was it. And so it was pretty moist in there. So I would imagine maybe at least six months. Maybe it took six months for his flesh to rot off of his bones. But, but all that's left now are his bones and another man died and the pallbearers were carrying him out to the same cemetery to bury him away in that same cemetery where Elisha had been buried and they look off in a distance and they see a band of thugs coming from Moab. Every spring, the Moabites would send their gangs up there. They were bloodthirsty thieves and robbers and rapists and murderers. And they would come as gangs and they would do harm and plunder and steal and kill. And oh, they were terrible. And so when these pallbearers carrying this dead body, when they saw that gang of Marauders coming from Moab, they didn't carry that man to the cemetery where he's supposed to be buried. They just rolled the stone aside to Elisha's. I don't even know if they knew that was Elisha's tomb or not. But they just rolled that stone away and said, Bye, and they threw that old boy in, dead. And he, he rolled and he rolled, and finally his 
dead body came in contact with the bones of Elisha. And when his dead body came in contact with the bones of Elisha, he came back to life. He was dead. But when his dead body hit the bones of Elisha, he came back to life. The Bible said he revived. Vived means alive. Revived means alive again. He came back to life and he stood up. And I have an idea. He got out of there pretty quick. Now, there are some things in the Bible that I wish God had told us just a little bit more about. That's all that is said here about this event. There are eight people in the Bible that were dead who came back to life. Elijah raised from the dead a boy. Elisha raised from the dead a boy. And then you have this man, whoever he was, when he touched the bones of Elisha, he came back to life. And then in the New Testament, you have five that were dead that came back to life. One of them was, was a man by the name of Eutychus who went to hear the Apostle Paul preach. And Paul preached and preached and preached and preached. And Eutychus got tired and he sat down in the window. And it must have had a two-story building because Eli uh, that Paul kept on preaching. And uh, Eutychus fell asleep and he fell out of the window and died. And Paul went and raised him from the dead, which I think is a pretty decent thing to do. I mean, if you die while I'm preaching, I'll do my best to get you back to life, I promise. But most of those others, we know some things about what happened during and after the raising of those people. But the Bible doesn't say anything about this except what I've read in those three little verses. He got sick with the sickness of which he died. And he died and he was buried. And he had to have been buried long enough for his flesh to have rotted off of his bones because all that was left was his bones. And then they throw this dead body of some man in and it rolls down and hits the bones of Elijah. He came back to life and he stood up. That's all it says. Let me give you three little takeaways from this and we'll have our prayer. First of all, I want you to understand that the life of every person comes to an end. The life of every person comes to an end. It's true of people who love God. And it's true of people who do not know God. Elijah, his life came to an end, not by death. He was translated into heaven through that fiery chariot. Elisha's life came to an end by death. Now, I've been preaching for 56 years. And in all of these 56 years, I have always believed that Jesus was coming soon. And I still believe that. I still believe that Jesus is coming soon. I wake up every morning listening for the trumpet. I know there are some who say, well, Brother Bob, I'm still looking for the signs. Hey, I've had my signs. I've graduated. I'm not looking for signs. I'm listening for the sounds of his coming. But he just may not choose to come in my lifetime. If I have the opportunity to go to heaven without dying, I'll take it. I'm not sure this dying business is all it's cracked up to be, to be honest with you. So if I can go to heaven without dying, I'll just soon go that way. But the odds of that happening are not real good. People who study demographics, we now have, we have 7 billion, 600 million people living on planet Earth tonight. 7 billion, 600 million people living on planet Earth right now. People who study demographics tell us that of all the people who have lived on planet Earth right to right now, half of them are alive today. So that means that about 7 billion, 600 million people have already lived on planet Earth and they have already died. Half who've ever lived here are alive, half are dead. 
Now, I don't know where they get those stats, but I'm just telling you what they say. Out of those 7,600,000,000 people who've already died, there are only two people who went to heaven without dying. A man by the name of Enoch, the Bible said he walked with God and God just took him. Little boy said, i would tell you what I think that means, preacher. I think it means that every day he walked with God and every day he walked back home. And one day he walked so far, God said, just come on to my house. And God just took him. He didn't die. God just took him. And then Elijah is the only other one who went to heaven without dying. He went up in a mighty chariot. Now, two, two out of seven billion, six hundred million, those are not very good odds. And so if Jesus tarries his coming, you're not going to go to heaven without dying. Now I cannot tell you when you're going to die. Some of you, you've already lived a long and full life. Some of you here tonight, including me, if we died tonight and our names were in the obituary column tomorrow, people would look and say, well, they lived a full life. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> I cannot tell you when you're going to die. There are some in this room tonight that have already lived longer than others in this room will ever live. That's just the way it is. I can't tell you when you're going to die. I cannot tell you where you're going to die. I cannot even tell you how you're going to die. Whether you'll die of sickness or you'll die having been shot in a battlefield or you'll die some truck run over you. I can't tell you how you're going to die or where you're going to die or when you're going to die. I cannot even tell you in whose presence you're going to die. Maybe you'll die and the hospital room be full of family members and friends or maybe you'll die out in some place all by yourself. I can't tell you that. I can't tell you when, I can't tell you where, I can't tell you how, I can't tell you in whose presence, but i tell you this, I can tell you why you're going to die. I can tell you why. The book of Romans says, and death came by sin. The Old Testament says, the soul that sinneth shall surely die. And the New Testament says, the wages of sin is death. People die because of sin. Now, don't push that to a false extreme, okay? That does not mean that people who die at a young age are more ungodly or more sinful than people who die at an old age. It doesn't mean that at all. And don't believe that if a person dies a very violent death, that he or she was more sinful than a person who dies a very peaceful death. That is not true. But the reason anybody and everybody dies at all is because we were contaminated by a disease called sin. And that's why we're going to die. Jesus forgives us of our sin when he saves us. But he does not take away that sting that sin brings when it brings death to us. Death, the Bible said, is an appointment. It is appointed unto man once to die. And that word appointed means it's on the agenda. It's in the storehouse. It's, it's just as much a part of the plan of God for you to die as it was a part of the plan of God for you to be born. The book of Ecclesiastes says there's a time to be born, and you know when that was because your mother told you. You weren't aware of it. You didn't come out of your mother's womb with a pen and a paper and write it down the date of your birth. You only know your birth date because somebody told you that's when it was. And if they were lying, you don't have any idea how old you are. But there was a time when you were born, and the Bible says, and there is a time to die. The life of every person comes to an end. That's true of saved people. That's true of lost people. Now, when saved people die, they go to heaven. 
Not because they were good people, not because they were nice people, but because they were saved people. When saved people die, when a Christian dies, he goes to heaven. But when a lost person dies, they do not go to heaven. The Bible teaches that they go to hell. In Luke chapter 16, the rich man died, and in hell he lift up his eyes. But the life of every person comes to an end. Number two, no one's death, no one's death stops the world from turning. You know, we like to fantasize about our death and think, well, brother, when I die, the world's going to be different. No. Do you want to know how long this world is going to remember you? You go home tonight, get you a big bowl and fill it up with water. Hold it in your right hand, a bowl of water. Take your index finger of your left hand. Put that finger down in that bowl of water. Take your finger out. And about how long it takes that hole to go away is about how long most people are going to remember you. No one's death is going to stop the world from turning. Your death is not going to stop time. The Bible says that at the beginning of the year, and that means springtime. In the Old Testament, that phrase, the beginning of the year, had nothing to do with January. It was the coming of spring. They, they, they counted the year's beginning as spring. would come. Boy, it's a brand new year. The green has come back. The flowers are budding. The trees are budding. It was the beginning of the year. Now, when did Elisha die? I don't know, but he'd been dead at least six months. So he died sometime probably back in the winter. But when he died, it did not stop time because spring followed the winter of his death. Your death is not going to stop time. I'll tell you something else. No one else's death, no one's death will ever stop the march of of evil. Evil just keeps right on marching on. When springtime came, sure enough, here came that bunch of thugs. Here came those murderers, thieves, and rapists, and robbers. Here they came, and they came with their swords drawn. They came with spears in hand. They came to wreak havoc on the people of God like they always had done. And the death of Elisha did not stop the march of evil. And the death of Jesus has not stopped the march of evil. I'm not a prophet, nor the son of a prophet, but I'm telling you, this world is more wicked than I've ever known in my life. You know, we've always had ordinary meanness. We've always had uh, thieves and liars and cheaters. We've always had that. But folks, I'm telling you, you and I are seeing a, a wave of demonism like we've never seen before. Ungodly. People don't think right anymore. It is as though the book of Romans chapter 1 has come to America. It is as though God has given us over to a reprobate mind. One major political party may be close to... Uh, proposing their nominee, a man who is married to another man. I'm telling you, that's demonic. It's ungodly. And I'm not, I'm not campaigning for anybody. But I'm telling you, folks, we live in an ungodly world. And the death of anybody, even Jesus, has not stopped the march of evil. And the death of anyone does not stop the death of anybody else. Death still reigns. Every day you can read your newspaper. And there are names in the obituary column of people who die. There are people who are dead tonight that were alive yesterday. There are people whose names were in the obituary column this morning who were alive when you and I were here for church Sunday morning. Death just keeps on. Death just marks. And every time death comes for somebody, 
it moves you one step closer to you. When I was a little boy, I had the joy of knowing three of my great-grandparents and all four of my grandparents and my uncles and my aunts and my mother and my dad. I, had, I knew all. I had a big family, and I knew all of those. And then my great-grandparents died. And now all four grandparents have died. All of my aunts and uncles have died. And my mother and dad have died. And I have shifted in the first place. <laughs> you see, that's just the way it is. Death still marches on. It is appointed unto man wants to die. And so nobody's death is going to stop the advance of death. And so nobody's death stops time. Nobody's death stops wickedness. Nobody's death stops death. But thank God nobody's death stops the power of God either. Elisha had been dead. He did not go to heaven in a mighty whirlwind, but he did go to heaven. Elisha was already dead. His spirit was in heaven. His bones were there molding in a grave. And when a dead body of another man touched his dead bones, that dead body came back to life. No one's death stops the power of God. Folks, listen, God is powerful. He's a big, God. Oh my soul, God is big. He's big. He's powerful. There's not anything He cannot do. There's not any person He cannot save. There's not any prayer He cannot answer. There's not any problem He cannot solve. There's not any place He cannot revive. I'm telling you, He's a powerful God. And he's just as powerful today as he's ever been. God's not old and sick and hobbling around on crutches with a diminished power. I'm telling you, God is powerful. He's powerful. Every life will come to an end. No one's death stops the world from turning. And one last thing. A person's influence goes on long after they die. Your influence goes on after you die. I was thinking today as I was looking over this message that I was going to share about the, about the great Christian men who have, have served God through the years. Men like the Apostle Paul and Timothy and Titus. And coming on up through church history. And you come to our generation. Men like W.A. Criswell. Men like Vance Havner, a wonderful Carolinian and my personal hero. Men like Bill Stafford and Ron Dunn. Men like Adrian Rogers and Bailey Smith. Men like uh, uh, R.A. Torrey. Men like uh, Mordecai Ham and Billy Graham and Billy Sunday. And how their influence goes on in the lives of God's people. You think about your parents. Think about how many decisions you have made in your life because of the influence of your parents on your life. I'm telling you, when I was growing up, there were things I wouldn't do because I knew my daddy didn't want me to do them. And there were places I didn't go because I knew my mother didn't want me to go there. And there were words I wouldn't say because I knew my parents didn't want me to talk like that. And so you think about how many decisions you have made and still make today because of the influence your mother and dad had on you and still have on you. Your influence goes on after you die. And that has a negative aspect, too. If you're a drunk, if you've lived your life as a drunk, then there's a good possibility that your sons or daughters will end up as drunks. 
Men, if you've been a wife abuser and a drug addict, and men, if you've been addicted to pornography and you've been unfaithful in your marriage, there's a good possibility your sons are going to be just like that. You see, your influence goes on after you die. I pastored Kirby Woods Baptist Church in Memphis for 20 years, a wonderful, wonderful church. After I'd been there about eight years, a godly, godly lady in our church died. She had come to see me regularly for the first eight years. She didn't come to fuss at me. She didn't come to tell me how to do things different. She came so that I could help her pray for her son. Her son was uh, was worked offshore. He was would be out in the water working a month, and he'd be home a month. And he was never saved, and it broke her heart. And she would come almost once a week, every week for eight years. And and she would sit in my office, and she would weep, and those tears would roll down her cheeks and hit the floor. And I'd hold that little bony hand of that woman, and we would just pray and pray. Oh God, please save Jim. God, don't let Jim die without Christ. God please and she died praying for her son to be saved and he never got saved not the first year not the second not the ninth or the tenth year after she was saved in my last year there I was preaching one Sunday morning I did not we had a it was a huge church we ran over 2,000 and I didn't know he was even in the congregation and when I gave the invitation Old Jim came out of the balcony, came all the way down the aisle and gave his heart to Jesus. I said, Jim, I'm so glad to see you coming this morning to be saved. He said, Preacher, do you know why I'm here? And I thought to myself, well, I must have preached such a wonderful sermon. He said, Preacher, you want to know why I'm here? I'm here because of the prayers of my mother. I have never forgotten seeing her cry over my soul. I've never forgotten hearing her call out to God. And every day, every night now, for over 10 years, my mother has come before me in my memory. And I came today because I cannot take it anymore. I have come today as a result of the prayers of a godly mother. Every person's life comes to an end. No one's death stops the world from turning. And your influence goes on after you die. I doubt anybody had thought much about Elisha for a good while. But I guarantee you when that dead man's body hit the bones of Elisha, He thought about Elisha, and he stood up in honor of the man of God. Oh, my. That's why, as Christians, we need to fight a good fight. And we need to keep the faith so that we can finish well. At my age in life, I do not want a bigger car. I do not want a bigger house. I do not want more money. I can say that before God. The driving passion of my life is to hear him say, well done. Well done. Would you stand please? Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. This is a different kind of sermon that I have preached this week. Uh, this is a new sermon. I've only preached it one other time. And, and uh, it's, it's a sermon that I guess really is more for a Bible conference perhaps than a revival. But I preached it tonight because God told me to. We've had such wonderful services here. We've had people come in every service. My soul, last night and Monday and, 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 and Sunday night, the, the altar has just been packed with people. But but God just laid it on my heart to tell you, from His Word, that one day your life's going to come to an end, and your death's not going to stop the world from turning. But the life you live 
will have an influence even after you die. And so maybe there's some of you here tonight who just need to make your way to this altar and say, Lord, I do not know how much longer I will live. Maybe 50 years, maybe 50 days. But Lord, I make my way to this altar tonight because I want to make a fresh commitment that I'm going to continue to fight a good fight. And I'm going to continue keeping the faith. I'm not throwing in the towel. I'm not giving up. And Lord, I want to finish well. I want to finish well. So Lord, I've done what you told me to do. I am not responsible for the results. I'm not responsible for the decisions. God, I'm just responsible to be obedient to you. And I've been obedient. And so now, Lord, the invitation is not mine. It's yours. You're the one who invites people to come. And so, Lord, if there are those who need to be saved, I pray they'd come and take Brother Greg by the hand. Preacher, I need to give my heart to Jesus tonight. I need to be saved tonight. And, Lord, maybe there's some that need a church home, not just a place to visit, but a place to be a part of the family. And maybe they would come tonight and say, Pastor, we want to join this church, the First Baptist Church. We want to be a member of this church. And Lord, I just believe there are Christians here tonight who would just like to step out and come and say, Lord, for however much time I have, I want to fight the fight and keep the faith. And most especially, I want to finish well. I do not want you to be embarrassed when I stand before you. Lord, we love you tonight. You draw the net now. Bring people to you as you choose to do so. In Jesus' name, amen. Folks are already.